Palm Ridge Library. We are thrilled to have Creighton Michael here for our third event for Culture Quest. Um, without further ado or much more delay, I'm going to go <laughs> ahead and start Creighton's um, PowerPoint. So give me one second. Slideshow. Okay. Okay, that should go full screen actually, right? So that it's all, isn't that supposed to go full screen? Yeah, full screen, Grayton. Oh, it is? Okay, all right. Well, I, I want to thank Marilyn. I also would like to thank the Pound Ridge Library and the creator of Culture Quest, author and board member, Lori Sarnoff. And a very special thank you to Jennifer and Elliot Coulter whose assistance and patience has made my presentation possible. So um, what we're going to do is, uh, I'll begin now. Um, my talk tonight will be a selected introduction to my studio practice of 50 years, using my interest in drawing as a guide, but seen through the lens of my various collaborations. What happened? I'm sorry, Creighton, it wasn't advancing. I'm just going to try it one more time. Uh, Jennifer, I did not. Okay. Finish my introduction, Creighton. Can you hear me? I can now, yes. Do, where do we go from here? Okay. We can't Jennifer, hear you now. can I finish? If you want to, sure, go right ahead. Yes, I would like to give some. Okay, I think I ended. Uh, or stopped for some reason. I have collections throughout the United States, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the National Gallery of Art. He has had solo exhibitions throughout the United States as well as in numerous galleries and art centers around the world, including Copenhagen, Montreal, and Reykjavik. As an educator, Mr. Michael has served on the faculty of several institutions and has been a visiting, he has conducted studio work throughout the United States. He is all keep blanking out and the Petona Museum of Art. As a curator, his credits include the art of Ruth Over, blurring boundaries. Can you hear me? The women yeah. of American abstract artists and uncharted American abstraction in the information age which opened in the early 2020. Yeah. Okay, I don't think we're gonna be able to hear the rest of that, so why don't we go ahead? Okay. We couldn't hear most of it anyway. All right, so are we ready to start? Okay. We're ready. Okay. Drawing is both a noun and a verb, a product and a process. Of course, that's traditionally defining drawing within a visual art context, but if drawing is seen instead as a marking system, similar to other marking systems, such as calligraphy, choreography, notation, and shorthand, doors to intriguing possibilities suddenly open. The image on the screen is a digital print from the Tapestry series, which was created as a drawing using layers of previous marking activities originally documented in video, 35 millimeter film, and etching plates, among others. A similar technique will be used years later in my IND collaboration, which I'll discuss toward the end of, the of this talk. Collaborations with artists and fields unfamiliar to mine expanded my capacity my capabilities and confidence for, for exploration as it allowed me to view ideas from multiple perspectives. 
To better understand how collaboration became an essential aspect of my practice, we must first go back a few decades to 1975, just before my transition from painting to sculpture by way of drawing would occur. As one can see, I was an aspiring young surrealist. That changed with my introduction to Lee Bontecue's work, which had a profound effect on me in terms of what art could be and how it was made. Realizing a stitch was also a three-dimensional mark was lesson number one. Mm. Leaving painting, I began my first three-dimensional series, Orgma, a contraction of the words organic materials. Actually, the materials weren't organic at all, but I liked the way it sounded. The way a word sounds continues to play an important role in my title selections. Exploiting the suggestive power or narrative potential of certain materials and textures was the second lesson I learned from Bontecue's work. Process is also the way an idea is manifested. I remember that. Mm -hmm. In the, er, in the early to mid 80s, my sculpture process mimicked automatic drawing. With an electric saw, I would cut shapes out of plywood sheets, then combine the linear cutouts into randomly formed constructions. In these works, the sense of mass was created by thin layers of stretched translucent paper or paper with a thin fiberglass surface. Shadows. Many of us were taught in grade school that an eraser is used only to rectify mistakes. Changing the perceived notion that erasing is correcting, I began to explore other approaches, such as portraying the history of a drawing's process. In landscape, thin films of gesso are used either to create new surfaces while adding spatial dimension, or as veil layers exposing its marking history. Eraser tends to be an action concept tied to two-dimensional formats. How would erasure appear three-dimensionally? In Olive, it became a unit of replacement, as if it were re re redrawn, while in Conifer, a translucent paper layer visually blurs the agitated forms behind. While teaching drawing at RISD, my rediscovery of Vincent van Gogh's late drawings would shift my focus to the anatomy of a drawing, more specifically, a Marx composition and its creation. Borrowing the concept of synchronous viewing, a mark and pattern are seen simultaneously, evident in the late ink drawings by Vincent van Gogh, I developed a series of drawings attempting to replicate the dual nature of a mark, being both gesture, a record of past action, and an element of pattern. These drawings were titled Rhapsody. Each Rhapsody, from the Greek meaning to piece together, was a quilting of multiple marking episodes, time segments, using a reed pen and ink to manually comprehend the sense of perpetual animation so central to Van Gogh's late drawings. Rhapsody would become the genesis for all future work in my practice. Years earlier, influences from the dazzling array of natural patterns throughout Upper Westchester had become evident in my work. Among the most profound were the shifting formations of duckweed, a ubiquitous aquatic surface plant. Its fluctuating patterns offered a perfect complement to Van Gogh's shift marking strategy. From my duckweed observations came the notion that a drawing is not only a pattern, but one whose appearance could continually change. This concept of fluid identity would establish for me a comparison between drawing and notation, draftsman and composer. The knowledge learned in Rhapsody became the catalyst for notation, a new painting series and painting process. Within a few years, it would also set a novel path for three-dimensional work. Gesture is also a type of mark. Fusing influences from Van Gogh's marking strategy with those of duckweed patterns, I began a new series, Grid, which translated the repetitive hand motions often associated with marking into tangible units or marks. 
Instructions from the accompanying schematic were used to con construct or reconstruct a drawing, often with multiple outcomes, paralleling the relationship between composer and musician. While shadows enhanced the dimensionality of each mark, they also replicated the motions occurring during the mark's creation, i.e. drawing. <coughs> with grid, I had a hybrid visual art form with multiple comparisons to music and the beginning of a new category of installation work, dimensional drawing. <coughs> Excuse me. At the time, the composer John Morton was making music by manipulating music box cylinders. This offered a two-way collaboration where I could create a grid based on the inked impressions of a modified music box drum and John could produce music based on the numerical patterns within a grid. The piece was named in memory of Peter Clark, one of the founders of Collaborative Concepts, who had unexpectedly passed away prior to our premiere. Here is a sample of talking to Peter. <laughs> To vary the effects of cast shadows, I began to experiment with additional translucent materials, such as glue and acrylic mediums. These new works were installations, not objects, like much of my work in the 80s and 90s, thus trading a fixed identity for a changeable one. Only the schematic had a constant identity. With grid pieces, wire had been used to imitate the gestures found in wrist movements during drawing. But what about the composition of a mark? How would it appear? My initial answer, <clears throat> excuse me, came with my next series titled DIP. Using wooden dowels dipped in a graphite paper mixture, each mark was numbered with a corresponding number listed on the template. Installation was similar to completing a jigsaw puzzle. The issue was that these staccato marks were too limited in terms of variety, with no ability to imitate the rhythmic gestures rooted in calligraphy. <clears throat> I needed a process with materials that could imitate Mark Toby's script three-dimensionally. Originally, pipe cleaners were used because of their wire spines, which I thought was needed to maintain a curvilinear shape. Later, I switched to glue stiffened cotton rope. After the linear units were formed, they were coated with an acrylic paper mixture. Prior to coating, charcoal, graphite, or ink was added to the mixture, depending on the type of drawing. Why these combinations? If a mark could be distilled from a conventional drawing, then made tangible, it would be made of paper pulp tinted with either charcoal, graphite, or ink. <coughs> the debris on the floor indicated past marking activity like charcoal dust. <clears throat> With changes of, in form and structure of each mark, I needed different installation strategies. Neither schematics nor templates could would be appropriate. Mapping with shipping instructions worked very well. <coughs> My second collaboration was with the composer Bruce Rotter, whose construct was based on observations both of me and my studio working and student teams installing the exhibition Tangible Marking. An encore performance of construct was, was given in 2014 at Colgate University. Three years later, Construct was choreographed and performed in Albany at the, at the Egg, making it a collaboration that continued far beyond our initial objective. Here is a sample of Construct. Go to Bruce Rotter Construct on YouTube to experience the music completely. <laughs> Thank you. 
My, <clears throat> in two, what we missed something. We there should be um, slide twenty. There we go. Uh, my second collaboration was with oh no, in two thousand eighteen. Choreographer Courtney Collado used body language inspired from the rhythms found in my work for carving air. Her dance was performed at and during the opening reception of my solo exhibition in process works by Creighton Michael from 2000, 2017. There we go. Um, I coined the term marking episode to underscore the element of time during a period of drawing. But most of my students didn't understand the term until I told them it was the same as a doodle. A Rhapsody installation focuses on the accumulation of marks occurring during a marking episode, not on the individual mark as in earlier works like Squiggle. In turn, these doodles function as drawing units, collectively constructing a drawing, either sequentially on the wall, dispersed on the floor, or stacked in layers. This floor drawing was inspired by the moss that covers Iceland's lava fields. It was a landscape drawing that one could view from multiple perspectives, but more importantly, over a period of time. Knowing a drawing was simply an accumulation of marks, it helped me to see drawing as a marking system. But the idea that a marking, that a marking episode, a doodle, could function as a mark combined with other marks to create a drawing, opened a new avenue of inquiry. Watching visitors explore my floor drawing in Iceland gave me the idea to include the dimension of time, which I discovered could be accomplished with video. This informed my next collaboration with Padina Roper, who had been my student, then intern, and finally studio assistant. Black tapestry would now define drawing for me as the redistribution of marking episodes. Here is a brief segment from Black Tapestry. Video collaborations with Panina would be a key component in filament. My second collaboration with my longtime friend, light sculptor Bill Fitzgibbons. The video actually serves as a lighting source for the drawing corridor, which visit visitors were expected to walk through where they would experience the drawing process in sight, sound, and time. Two views of the drawing corridor are seen on the right side of this slide. Our previous collaboration, Eel Light, in 2006, had fused Bill's expertise of LED lighting with my linear plywood structures to transform a busy New York City storefront into a coral reef. Here is a brief clip of filament. The entire piece is on my website, as are others mentioned tonight. Okay, um, an episodic drawing collaboration intervals began with a suggestion by ceramic sculptor, Professor John McMillan, after working with me on my dimensional drawing project hosted at Mary Washington University. It was a collaboration that took a drawing episode captured in blue saturated rope, the first stage of a Rhapsody unit, through multiple transformations, finally becoming a ceramic doodle. 
By, two, by 2010, and again with help from Panina Roper, I began to play with computer applications like Graphic Converter. I discovered hidden within an image were other images with varying degrees of visual similarity to the host persona. Patterns more referential to the host I titled Distill, while those less were labeled Extraction. Later through a computer anomaly, a barcode-like pattern emerged from a raw image file instead of the visual image. It occurred to me that the computer was drawing the image with a digital vocabulary. These computer distilled patterns I named corrupt, corrupted image patterns. Together, these configurations reside under the category of trans-dimensional motifs, reflecting their origins from past drawing activities in all dimensions, two, three, and four. Creating new work from my previous marking experiences seem to be a form of collaborating with my past self. Shadows Trilogy was a two-year remote collaboration with a graphic artist and two animators. The piece reveals the limitations of communication systems, often leading to feelings of despair. In Shadow Speak, we hear someone typing repeatedly, can you see what I am saying? As the shadows of someone signing the words, can you hear what I am saying? Pairing the typewriter's cadence with a rhythmic flickering of shadows generates an atmosphere of loneliness. Here is a brief segment of Shadow Speak. To see more, please go to my website, www.creightonmichael.com. Oh, there we are. Um, it was probably in graduate school in the mid 70s that I first became aware of a remote process used by Laszlo Mahalinaj in the creation of his 1922 telephone paintings. Employing the technology of the time, Mahalinaj directed a sign painter over the telephone to create five new works. This act of disengagement and an artist's ability to abdicate creative responsibility fascinated me. I had applied a similar strategy in developing Shadows Trilogy and to earlier installation works such as Grid and Squiggle. With Punctuation, my next collaboration, I would attempt to replicate Mahali Naj's early process. I selected two digital files from previous marking activities, one analog, one digital, and seven color samples. All nine files were emailed to Christopher Shore master printer at the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Norwalk, with instructions to mix and match the plates, their orientation and color combinations. No further communication or instructions occurred until the prints were finished and ready for me to sign. I will admit that I worked with Chris for 10 years prior, so we had a, a very good working relationship. Based on the success of punctuation, Chris and I collaborated on the IND print project, 2017 to 18, which was also created remotely. It was a 12 print limited edition suite produced at CCP. Each IND print was created from a layered drawing constructed of previous marking episodes. Remember Tapestry 3610 shown earlier this evening? The processes were similar. This project began with the creation of black and white digital scans and finished with the monochromatic intaglio editions. Pictured here are only the prints from the intaglio limited editions. Once again, pattern assumes the role of a mark in creating of a drawing, creating a drawing. Uh, Double Dutch was one of my favorite collaborations due in part to its complexity. I, along with eight other artists, had been asked to select a work from the Crest Collection at the Allentown Art Museum 
and create and to create a work in reaction to to it for the exhibition past present conversations across time i chose two 17th century dutch wedding portraits and created a five part drawing focusing on period clothing portrait structure and an imagined wedding feast I had long been fascinated with the 17th century lace collar known as a ruff. But when I discovered images of goffering irons, which were used to press the lace collars, I could see a very humorous animation emerge employing images of goffering irons as principal actors in a fantasized wedding feast. Here is an image of a goffering iron translated into a line drawing, then corrupted image pattern, becoming the basic elements for the animation. This will be a brief clip, uh, well, maybe not that brief, but of Double Dutch, The Wedding Feast. The entire piece is on my website. Jen McDonald had been a student of mine twice, some 10 years apart, and at two different colleges in two different cities. When we first met, she was studying sculpture, but a decade later, she had become a hand-drawn animator. Today, she is also the public art senior management specialist at New York City School Construction Authority. The composer, David Bidenbender, had recently been our guest as a Cultivate Fellow from the Copeland House in Westchester. With backgrounds in electronic as well as liturgical music, David was able to create a synthesized soundtrack based on 17th century European musical structures. In addition to his busy schedule as a composer, David is an assistant professor of music at Michigan State University in East Lansing. RGB drawing began simply as a conversation with Ben Deep around the idea of documenting drawing activity through photographic means, something I'd been naively experimenting with for a number of years. Ben had, ben had a long history in photography, both behind the camera and in the darkroom. With Ben's extensive knowledge of digital photography and printing, coupled with a deep appreciation for 19th century photographic practices, we were able to translate the captured gestures associated with drawing into images reminiscent of early large format photography. The, in these works, transdimensional motifs are used as drawing tools, not as marks to create a drawing. The drawing activity is photographically captured as a single frame image. Though the images appear static, they are actually a series of sequential marking actions occurring over a time span ranging between 45 and 90 seconds. This slide is an image of our installation at the IPA in Reykjavik, Iceland, 
May of 2017. One of the most gratifying, varied, and certainly longest collaborations was my dimensional drawing project. It was a two-tiered collaboration with student teams working together with me and host faculty members to create an exhibition from selected works of my dimensional drawing series, including works from GRID, PIP, and Squiggle. These images are of students working together installing selected works from my dimensional drawing series at different venues over a nine year period. Additional venues are pictured here. One of the more surprising takeaways from this project was learning how many students could not use a level. Oh, after, after more than 50 years of drawing and four decades of teaching drawing, I can definitely say drawing is primary, not preliminary. Thank you. I'm back on. <laughs> That was amazing, Creighton. Thank you so much. I wanted to up, open up the session uh, to questions from the audience, comments, questions. If you would be kind enough to type them in the chat box at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on what view you're in. Um, and in the meantime, I just would like to ask Creighton a couple of questions too. I had read your biography that we have on the website and it said that you were working on a project, um, Rube Goldberg. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, yeah, um, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, I thought they were doing it from there. Um, that project uh, ended, I guess, when did it, it ended in January, I guess, yeah. January of, two, of 2020. Uh, where are you, Jennifer? I can't see you, I can't hear you, I can't hear anything. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> All right, we need to get you back on the screen, don't we? Yeah. There we go. Where are you? I'm right here. How can I restart the video? For Creighton. I can't do it from here, he has to turn around himself, but I press and start with you. Okay, if you can just press start video at the bottom of your screen, Creighton. Yeah. There we go. It keeps saying it's unable to start. Hmm. Well, perhaps we could listen to your answer, Ask Creighton. To start video. That's on you. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, and now okay, I can. It's Maryland, uh, yeah. Oh, there you okay. go. So uh, the Rube Goldberg exhibition, um, I guess, began around, we began working on that in around 2015 with the publication of uh, the book, The Art of Rube Goldberg. And uh, Max Weintraub was the curator. I, I'm, I really wasn't, uh, I mean, though I helped to, uh, Mar uh, Max with um, selection and concepts. Um, I prefer to stay in the backgrounds, uh, background with uh, projects and kind of uh, get the ideas and the curators and the funding and whatever kind of as a producer. So that, uh, that, was, that show was picked up by International Arts and Artists and it traveled for three years and finished uh, its last venue was January. Um, well, it was, I think, September to January of um, 2020, I believe, uh, at, the, at the Queens Museum. Or maybe that was, yeah, <laughs> the Queens Museum. Great, thank you. Um, I was curious how um, the pandemic has affected you um, as artistically? Have you had to search elsewhere for inspiration, um, you know, just to expand what, what would um, get the creative juices flowing in this time when we're all so isolated from each other? 
Um, no, I, uh, I've actually spent the, the last year uh, archiving a 50-year studio practice and um, scanning slides. I mean, my, my slides began in 1969. So up until about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, 35 millimeter slides were the currency that artists worked with. And you didn't have one slide of everything, you had 40 slides of everything. And uh, so slides also do not, uh, are not archival. And after about 30 years or so, they start to fade or the emulsion uh, shifts. So I was able to capture um, a number of the images uh, uh, through, and in fact, what I was doing was scanning all the slides uh, representative of each, of each piece. And in sculpture, that would be multiple view, uh, perspectives. And, um, and then uh, toss them. I mean, it was buckets and buckets and buckets of slides, which translated in thousands of dollars of, of processing and film and, and those sort of things. Uh, and also, I learned very um, sadly what a horrible photographer I'd been. <laughs> and thank God for the digital abilities to kind of clean that up, at least for the future. <laughs> okay, I've got a message here from Paul, who says, thank you. Wonderful trek through your creative collaborations. I'm still greatly moved by the grid series. Please say a bit more about what you called transition to sculpture. Did you truly stop 2D exploration? Um. <clears throat> No, but I sort of, I stopped the fo I mean, what happened was um, I got to, uh, when I, when I transi transitioned, which is probably not the right term, but when I moved from 2D to 3D, I sort of uh, uh, put all, I, it was more of a hybrid move than, than one or the other. And, um, and I felt, in, in, in many ways, uh, the work from the uh, late 70s into the 80s and early 90s um, that was three-dimensional really combined aspects of, of, of both three and two dimensions. Um, and so it was sort of this drawing sculpture that at that point was really reflected or contained as an object. And the object started to break apart uh, in, figuratively and literally uh, in the, uh, toward the end of the, of the 90s. And I had got, and then I got to a point, um, I guess around 99 or so, that I felt I'd said everything I could say about, everything I could say that I wanted to say in sculpture, I thought I'd already said. And uh, it was time to, to kind of take a, um, a sabbatical from that and go back to painting, which I had literally stopped doing in, in traditional terms uh, for 20 years. And, um, and so I did, and that didn't last long, but I did, I mean, and I started, I, I, that, that sort of coincided with uh, moving to Westchester and, um, so I started, uh, and it was kind of what did I learn by not painting, basically. And uh, the natural patterns were so influential. And, uh, and then this is kind of um, um, epiphany with, with Van Gogh's drawings and the, the natural, natural patterns I was seeing kind of, kind of came together and the idea about going back to three-dimensional work, but not to do it in the way I'd been doing it. Um, I wanted to, one of the problems too with sculpture in the eighties and nineties, it was very large and very fragile and these are very bad combinations. And so from a shipping standpoint, um, the, just the, the logistics of that were quite expensive. And the uh, it, um, 
it got to be a real, it was becoming a problem. And I thought, well, if I could figure out how to do three-dimensional work that would be installed by somebody else, I could, I, it would might be kind of interesting. And this all kind of came together with its relationship to music um, and that, that relationship between a composer and, um, and, um, and a draftsman or a composer and a, and a musician. And then they, I think in terms of the grid, uh, uh, the idea was too that I'd like, uh, that I wanted in the installation and which would also uh, the, uh, when the installations would have um, a lot of freedom by the installer. And I was trying to, and as, that, as, that, as, uh, as the grids developed over a six year period, um, there was more and more, much more, there was more and more freedom that was given to the installer. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Rambling as it was. <laughs> um, you had mentioned just a moment ago about the collaboration with um, music, which kind of segs right into the next question, which is from David, who says, thank you for this inspiring presentation. Um, could you talk more about how music and your collaboration with musicians, it's actually a several part thing, do the makers of notation influence your practice? And what about the physical impact of sound itself, which leaves its own trace? Um, <clears throat> in general, I'm learning more about music. Um, I had always, in my studio, there was always music being played and, um, and a variety of different types of music. And it was, not only for the sense of rhythm that it gave me and uh, and allowed me to kind of kind of have a flow with what with my work and the and the time um, but it also was a I guess a form of um, passive communication or conversation where I didn't really have to respond to anyone but I didn't feel alone either so um, which if, you know, as artists uh, we spend quite, and I don't mean just visual artists, uh, artists in general, spend quite a bit of time uh, with their craft by themselves. I guess uh, actors probably spend that time in practice and then, you know, more collaboratively with uh, other actors and in other formats. Uh, that was such a multi-part question. What, yes. <laughs> what other things, um, uh, the notation, of, well, the idea of, the idea of capturing or, or really trying to go into a kind of a drawing anatomy thing. Uh, what was, what made, what was, what, what was a drawing? How did, how did it happen? Uh, what were the parts about that? And so it sort of simply divided it into, obviously it's marks. And so how are marks made and what are marks made of was the, the basic two categories. And then, uh, so I had all, so, okay. So I started first with grid. Um, and, I, and, and it was also this, there was kind of this uh, cult, uh, coming together of a number of forces. I had always worked alone. I'd rare, I rarely up until that point had assistance. And, um, and I had three students who wanted to be my intern, or interns, and, uh, and they wanted to come at the same time. And I was like, I don't know what to do with all these people. And it was right around this time that I had started making this, going to this idea of, of components and, um, and units and which were marks. And um, then I could have them, I could actually create the mark, capture the, the wrist movement. And then they, and then I would have a little bit of industry going in the studio. And um, 
So the, the other part to that was, uh, how does it go from my studio to other venues? And so that process of transportation and packaging um, and then reinstallation. And that was where the, I guess it was at that point too, that um, the relationship between a music musical notation and and how a mu and, a, and how a mu musician performed that music uh, would be a, a great parallel for uh, having the sculpture done that way. And it also and it, and it would come apart and would travel in a small box, and um, and then, in fact, the idea of uh, of uh, of doing the dimensional drawing project really happened again by accident because uh, one of the early shows in which the grids were being shown, um, the curator called me and said, we've got a little bit of a problem because you know, the show opens in a week. We only have two uh, installers. These, pe these pieces take a lot of time to install. And I thought, yeah. Uh, they do. Um, but you also have a school that's associated with the museum and uh, of arts, an art school. And I thought, I, I suggested to her, what about getting students to install the works? And to make a long story short, she did and it worked. And this is where I got the idea for the dimensional drawing project. And it, <coughs> excuse me, um, You know, after retiring from teaching, my throat's not as strong as it used to be. <laughs> but I'm not used to talking this much. So, um, so this, I mean, a lot of what I, what I have done, what I do, what I continue to do is really sort of by accident, um, constructive accident or by play or by what ifs. And so, you know, this dimensional drawing project uh, which kind of develops basically as a reason to get this show installed. But then I notice that the students are so engaged. They come to the opening, they come, they come to uh, the, the talk. They, if this was like a, a watershed moment for the school and the, and the museum. They had, hadn't had that kind of turnout. And um, so, what is kind of working out of is in a studio situation also becomes an educational tool. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to a comment from Michelle who says, thank you Creighton and Palm Ridge Library. Wonderfully inspiring talk, I agree. And from Melissa, hi Creighton. Fascinating to hear how you went from hands-on drawing to hands-off drawing. Could you explain or re-explain the interactive process of the last two films you showed? Thank you. Oh, which were, um, can look at back clear my notes here. So that would be um, Double Dutch. Oh yeah, okay. And Shadow well, Speak. Okay, Shadow Speak, let me start with that one. Um, I had for a long time, well, I've been interested in, in the idea of sign language or in, in signing and uh, that, and how that connected in a way to drawing. And um, I, was, I was actually fascinated just, just by the, uh, choreography of it and um, and I thought about uh, how how that would look if you just had the shadows and um, and then if it were just the shadows it would be more like drawing it would be the physical element but it so it needed a, com a companion and a typewriter sound which is something probably anyone that's younger than 
anyone younger than 30 probably never heard. So uh, there was this kind of, and, and, but, it, but also th that not knowing the sound, the, the cadence of the typewriter I thought would be interesting. And um, it, situations occurred and I was able to, to do that and it was all, and I had, there was a graphic of a person I had worked with who I, I pitched the idea and then she actually got the animators. So, um, and at, at the time I was starting to, I, I, like I said, uh, the uh, Mahali Naj uh, process, it's something that just kept, uh, I couldn't forget. It was something so fascinating that to, you know, again, you know, this, the earlier, per, the earlier thing was said, where you go from hands on to hands off. Um, and, and that was really a kind of a process too. I mean, uh, being able to, to direct someone to do things that, first off, I think, in, at least in my case, it was trying to direct with something maybe that I thought I, I knew what I wanted to see, but I wasn't sure, to saying, okay, I've got a range. Let's see where you fall in there. And then that was that was underscored by the dimensional drawing project because I mean I would I would go in and I'd see how some students would reinstall these pieces. I would go, no, I really didn't like that. But then I would have to say, well, you, you know, you can't have it both ways. And but it, it, that part was also interesting because often as, 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 as different as things could be, they tended to all be very similar. Um, and so I, it, I got to be kind of used to that and, and the, 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 the Shadows trilogy, which actually started out to be just one and uh, it went so well that we kind of made it a trilogy. Uh, was also kind of right in the time where I was experimenting I was just, I was looking at all of the, the digital uh, elements that were happening visually and, um, and process wise. Uh, let's see, so the other one is double Dutch. So, I mean, I already had this kind of background relationship with Shadows Trilogy. So when the opportunity came up from the Allentown Art Museum I thought, wow, this would be kind of fun to, to see where we could take this. And it, again, it just evolves very quickly. Um, I had thought that when I did, the, that the work I would have selected from the Crest Collection would have been totally different. And as a matter of fact, just as a point of history, I grew up in Memphis and, <clears throat> excuse me. And the first, my first experience of looking at European art was at the Brooks Museum in Memphis and it was the Crest Collection. So this was the same Crest Collection. This was the uh, Samuel Crest, I think, I think it was the name, had, had, had been, um, came from uh, Allentown or just outside of Allentown. And the final bit of his collection, the, I guess the collection he had lived with was given to the museum um, at his death. So I go in and, and for something, the, 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 the Dutch wedding portrait struck me and I had no idea why, but, uh, but I think it was the lace collar. And that sort of set off these ideas that uh, would be kind of fun to do in you know, three-dimensional drawing and two-dimensional drawing. And that's, you know, just kind of fell into place. Uh, uh, Jen McDonald had, um, had been working with her on some things. And I mean, she'd been, a, she was in graduate school at Hunter when I was teaching. So that's how we'd reconnected. And she was, like I said, she was doing um, uh, uh, hand-drawn animation. And, um, and David Bidenbender, Luckily, happened to be a, a, a host, a, a guest of ours, as a cultivate fellow. So, 
I, I, I couldn't have planned any of this or very little of it. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I'm rambling on, I know, but uh, <laughs> that's sort of the way I work. <laughs> I have a message here. Oh, this is from Scott. And he asks, could you talk some more about your relationship and use of randomness? Oh, what? Just be a little faster. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, what, was, um, what was that? Sure. Um, it's from Scott. And he says, thank you for a wonderful evening exploring your artistic. I'm sorry, that's from Leslie. Let's see. Scott says, could you talk some more about your relationship and use of randomness? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, I'm always fascinated by the difference between accident, random, and what was the other one? chance and it was explained to me once and unfortunately I didn't write it down so the randomness or and it, and I guess I use I try to play with all three I think it comes out of my interest in surrealism um, and I think that because of that interest it allowed me to to be able to um, um, collaborate with with more people and in different in different uh, areas, because I didn't necessarily have a specific uh, control about what was going to happen, and I was kind of open to see what would what would happen, uh, and try to learn from that. So. Um, I, I, I mean, that's, it just, it's just part of the practice. And I don't know if there's, I, I know there, there are fine lines of difference between random accident and chance, but I guess I play with all three of them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Leslie has a comment. Uh, Creighton, thank you for a wonderful evening exploring your entire artistic career. Was that the one who said I had, it's almost eight o'clock, we got to quit? That's fine. We're just okay. a couple of minutes over, no big deal. Um, people can leave when they need to, of course. Um, from Marcy, she says, Creighton, your intellectual curiosity and discipline has always been an inspiration. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. It's Leslie Heller. Oh, Leslie Heller. We're, okay, <laughs> Leslie Le oh, Okay, what, all right, I'm sorry. What, oh, sorry. Okay, there's... moving along. We've got from Lisette Topple. Thank you for the eye-opening presentation of deconstructing and reconstructing so many different mediums and art forms like music, film, graphics, sculpture, and more. Truly inspiring and innovative. Keep on going for it. Was that a question or a compliment? That was a compliment, it oh, sounds okay. like, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, how the hell do I answer that one? Okay. Um, another comment from Lisa. She says, agreed. I am always amazed and inspired by your creative investigative work. Great talk. Thank you. From Noel, thank you Creighton and to Pound Ridge Library for this presentation. It has been very informative and insightful. Michelle says, I wish I had some of your creativity. Um, lastly from <laughs> Judith Dupree, who is one of our, our original uh, Culture Quest performers, uh, artists. Uh, who wants to say, Creighton, thank you for talking about collab your collaborations and how they've evolved. Fascinating and exemplary. Thank you. I agree. Uh, it's, what an incredible evening it's been. Uh, so much to take in. Well, uh, yeah, I, I would say about creativity to Michelle, it's a blessed curse. <laughs> That's terrific. Well, as you mentioned, we are starting to run over. Marilyn, did you want to um, yes. do the, the closing remarks? Uh, I really am so sorry that uh, you lost me in my introduction because his career, Creighton, your career has been so fantastic. And your talk this evening was so enlightening and amazing. I had some questions, but it's kind of late and I think I will defer for now. I'm okay. just so honored that the library in our culture series, Culture Quest series, was able to have someone like yourself to enlighten and inform and share your work with us. So a very big thank you. 
Oh, thank you. And I don't know if my thank yous were heard when I started, but uh, I also I wanted to thank thank you, Marilyn. I, I wanted to thank the Pound Ridge Library and uh, the creator of Culture Quest, Arthur and uh, author and board member Lori Sarnoff. And a very special thanks to Jennifer and Elliot Coulter, because if without their assistance and uh, and patience, uh, my presentation would have been possible. So. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. I just wanted to let all of you fans out there know um, that we are going to have this entire session has been recorded and it's going to be oh, placed God. in our archives for our website. <laughs> How about some uh, editing on that? Be it? very proud. I think it went very, <laughs> very well, uh, which you can find on our website in the next few days under the Culture Quest Discover button. Again, thank you so much, Crate. Now, I, I can't tell much. you what a wonderful evening it's been, and we can't thank you enough from all of us at Pound Ridge Library. Thank, thank you. All of you. Oh, I can great. see a few squares there. So. <laughs> I mean, portals, not squares. Portals. Thank you, Crate, and enjoy the rest of your evening in your glory, glorious presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Creighton.